Australia's business channel. This is Media Week. Hello and welcome to the program. Ahead, we'll bring you an update on the 10 takeover speculation. Seven downgrades its ad market forecasts for 2015 and we'll also bring you the latest radio ratings. But first, it's been a huge period of change for the magazine industry in recent years amid both ownership change alongside the structural impact of the rise of digital. At Bauer Media, Australia's biggest magazine publisher, the changes continue following the resignation of its CEO, Matt Stanton, last month. It comes after a tumultuous few years for the Australian business, which was sold by Nine to German publishing group Bauer back in 2012. For more on all of this and what's ahead for 2015, we're joined by Tony Kendall. He's the director of sales at Bauer Media and also, of course, our co-host, James Man Manning, editor and publisher of Media Week, is here as well. Welcome to you both. Yeah. Tony, Fine, thanks for coming in. Very well. Um, so the new CEO is starting soon, David Goodchild. Have you had a chance to meet him yet? You know, he arrived in the country today, but uh, I think he'll be getting over his jet lag. Uh, so we're spending some time with him next week, so looking forward to that. He's got a very rich history with the Bowers and a very rich history in publishing and publishing management. So, yeah, looking forward to working with him. Look, you've been in a similar position yourself. So just how challenging will, you know, this, this role be? Uh, look, I think it's... <laughs> Sure, every business has got its challenges at the moment as we go through periods of change, but we're in really strong shape for 2015 and looking forward to launching of digital networks and continue to invest in magazines throughout the course of next year. Tony, you've been talking a lot about uh, what's happening digitally with the company and you're admitting you're a bit late to the digital party, but have you got to be careful not to go too far the other way and, and focus too much on digital and maybe neglect your, your readers and your advertisers in the print side? No, look, I don't think that's the case at all. I think they're both mediums are used for very, very different things. Magazines have never been time sensitive in terms of their content. That's things, you know, we print them four weeks before they come out. So they're about a luxury read, they're about spending some me time and digital people want a more snack type information, a faster feed. So all the things we're doing in terms of investing in digital are basically served, designed to serve women particularly across both mediums. And I think there's a great space for both of them. So speaking of that, that segment of the market, women in particular when it comes to digital, um, how do you sort of rank now? Who do you have to overtake, I guess, to, to attain that number one position? Um, also, we're currently reaching about two and a half million women online and our goal is to reach four million. I think Fairfax do a really good job, News do a really good job in terms of their female target groups, but there's no one great digital destination for women and certainly all of the research we did, and we did a lot of research into what she wants online and how you better best serve that online, says there's a really big gap in the marketplace. So the products we're developing, as part of the fact we're relaunching Australian Women's Weekly and Women's Day to iconic Australian brands online, but also launching into this food, homes, family and health space with family to love, food to love, home to love and health to love. So in what sort of a time frame are all those being rolled out? Uh, in March we do Australian Women's Weekly, Women's Day, food to love and homes to love and not long after that families and health to love. Okay. So busy, busy first three, four, six months of yeah, next year. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In terms of print, um 2014 has been pretty busy, closed a few magazines, yep. launched a few other ones. Um, uh, do you expect to maybe have some digital only brands um, soon? I mean, we've got seen uh, Shop to Your Drop yep. go quarterly with a, a more of a focus on digital. We've got two um, digital only products that we'll, we'll launch in the early part of next year as well. Okay. So and what will they be? Can't say. <laughs> this day, but no, we're really excited. So, there is so that is something you'll we'll see absolutely. more of? Yeah, no, that must be more of it. Certainly, that's part of the digital roadmap. We're going to launch new magazines next year as well, too, though. Yes. And the mags we have launched have done really well. So, yours is going strongly, Homes Plus is going strongly, Elle's going really strongly across multiple platforms. And again, you know, Elle is a brand we launched that online first. We talk about its audience holistically in terms of its Facebook followers, its Instagram followers, its web audience, the events audience we attract as well as you know the great magazine we produce 12 times a year. Um, so when it comes to magazine circulation weekly um, we've had some numbers on that just in the past week or so. What were some of the, the big highlights there for Bauer? Uh, well the readership was out in th just this last week and the, so the biggest highlights for us were our two flagship titles grew so Women's Day and Women's Weekly grew so Women's Weekly grew to by two and a half percent thereabouts to almost 2.4 million people reading that every month and Women's Day grew by 1.1 percent which is a readership of 2.1 million people and 
again, Women's Day across both print and digital reaches now close to 3.8 million women in the course of a month. So huge, huge numbers. And we had some great results in terms of Harper's Bazaar was up 15% mm -hmm. and Real, Real Living, Living was up well. 21%. So Real Living now reaching 200 and 20 odd thousand people every month. It's a, it won the magazine of the year awards. It won the editor of the year awards. It's a fantastic magazine. And, you know, people sort of sometimes talk about, you know, the as we are today, you know, with the speculation about the future of magazines. But I mean, Real Living is, is reaching more than twice as many people who watch the highest rating show on Foxtel Lifestyle being Grand Designs Australia. I mean, it's huge numbers. Mm. We've seen um, publishers experiment with total readership figures. I think. In the figures that Emma released, the um, I think you had Women's Weekly, Women's Day, and Clio in there. Yep. Um, why only three? Will we see that grow? Do you think there'll, there'll be more titles will go into that sort of? Uh, I think we're going for all titles. I think that, that was just the best story. Oh, they, they, the press just, they just pulled out that for yeah. highlights. Yeah. Oh, so you do have figures for, for, for everything. Mags, yeah. Okay. For all the mags, fully cross-platform, and those mags we, we just pulled out for the press release. Okay, okay. So, um, in regards to Elle, you mentioned that earlier. We've had some spin-offs with the TV Week, um, you know, link up there. How, how have all that, how's it been going? Um, Elle's great. So, we've had uh, the Elle Style Awards, which huge event we ran mm. two or three weeks ago now. Get a lot of coverage for that. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it shows the power of the brand in terms of creating a truly unique event and live experiences are a big part of what we're about because certainly advertisers and consumers want to you know despite how wonderful everything is in the digital age people want to have physical experiences and certainly advertisers are looking for the opportunities where they can you know do the experiential thing and have you know one-on-one -on -one conversations in real life with face-to-face -face people so that's a big part of our program and L across there'll be lots more L extensions you'll see during the course of the year We've just launched Cosmo TV as well, so a, a YouTube series um, in partnership with The Body Shop. So again, great brands and how do you extend the life of those brands into lots of different platforms that we know different people are consuming at different times give for a, different reasons. Give us a quick update on the readership. Uh, you always quote the Emma data and a lot yeah. of people seem to have adopted that. Do you need to keep on top of Roy Morgan's, of course, still measuring magazine audiences? Do you need to keep on top of that? Do you subscribe and for, for some of the agencies that maybe use that as their, their uh, metric? We still subscribe to Morgan. Um, some agencies still use Morgan, but as an industry and as a business, we're committed to Emma and that they're doing a terrific job and meeting all the, the sort of KPIs that you'd set for them and their research methodology is really strong and robust. Tony Kendall, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Nadine. Thanks, James. Tony Kendall is Director of Sales at Bauer Media. Well, with uh, Corporation, Wynn Corporation owner Bruce Gordon saying this week that he would not be selling his close to 15% stake in 10 as takeover speculation continues, it comes as potential buyers, including Discovery and Foxtel, have held meetings with 10 management. Let's get some of the share market reaction to all the speculation. We're joined now by Evan Lucas from IG. So, Evan, welcome to the program. 10, a beleaguered company. Let's just put that out there. Um, okay. How have shares um, been faring amid all of this takeover speculation? Uh, look, they've certainly been doing very well, Nadine. They are up roughly around about sort of 13 cents since the real major, major low. They've dropped back down to around about 27 cents. So it has been a little bit of a, of a fairly meteoric ride. There's no doubt that when we did hear talk at time, Warner was on the table, moved it up to 25 cents. So currently sitting at 27, we do know that we saw Discovery and Foxtel meeting at Citigroup in Sydney to actually have an actual proper discussion and higher level talks. There still doesn't mean there's going to be a deal, but it certainly is getting the excitement there, actually showing that people are genuinely interested. And it wasn't just to Foxtel and also Discovery, but there was two major private equity brands sitting there as well. So no doubt 10 has been looked at in a big, big way. You've already alluded to what's going on with Bruce Gordon, but listen to Kerry Stokes. He certainly suggests he would. You know, the question would be Lachlan Murdoch and James Packer. I think if the deal was right, they probably would as well. So that's the interesting dilemma around all of this is the major shareholders and sort of the fighting that may come mm -hmm. with it. Let's bring in James Man Manning from Media Week. What do you make of Bruce Gordon's stance? Will he stick by it? Well, he's saying the things you would expect someone to say if they were holding out for yeah. more money. He says he's not doing that, but um, you sort of take him at his word. But, but you think there would come a point where he might be convinced to, to sell, you know. Um, but look, the, uh, Evan mentioned the shares are going up, but they're still a long way short of what a lot of people yeah. bought in at. So they would really want to see some significant increases, I think. Yeah.
Uh, let's talk 7 West Media. We heard from the company this week and some pretty dire warnings. Tim Warner um, at the company's AGM warning that we could see a first half profit slide of as much as 10%. Mm -hmm. So how has this been coming out in the market, Evan? Yeah, look, as you'd expect, the market hasn't liked it at all. It's down around about 3% since the announcement. So not a huge move when you consider what it's talking about. I found it very interesting that obviously they are finally probably the last ones out there to say that there's a major softness in the market. I also found it interesting that Tim Warner's comments were our response to it. I think that's a really interesting, very open ad admission that maybe Seven had, had dropped the ball here. We know that listening to Nine, we know obviously what we just talked about with Ten, how the advertising market, particularly on free-to-air, has been. You know, Subscription digital is where most people are looking towards and other forms of touch media. So I found that very open. I, again, having a look at $1.77, you now put 7 West Media in a level that it hasn't been for a while. It does become slightly attractive maybe on a yield basis. But if you are now seeing revenues move away, net profit falls away, and it doesn't matter what your payout ratio is, it's not going to get there. So I, I, I am disappointed in that numbers, and I'm not surprised the market is as well. Yeah, James, Tim Warner is saying that cost cutting is really going to be the key and be the focus. What do you make of that? I mean, how much fat is there to trim at, at an organization like 7 West Media? Um, yeah, probably a little bit. I mean, they've been focusing costs for quite a while. Since Kerry Stokes was pointing to the reason for the ad softness, he was sort of blaming government ad spend, you know, saying, look, that is why we're really down year on year. Tim was mentioning, look, for the full year we might, you know, meet what we were, our initial guidance. So I think they're hoping, look, it's a bit soft now, but maybe the start of uh, 2015 will be a bit kinder to them. And all, and all of these AGMs from the media company were hearing for more calls for the government to relax these media owners ship laws. Yeah, and then some, some um, noise from Seven this week. Look, they could get to a position where they'd support changes. They've been the holdouts, if you like, so far. But Seven saying, look, if there can be real industry consensus, well, we'll fall into line with everybody else. Okay. And one other media story out there affecting the markets, Evan. APN Outdoor debuting on the ASX mm -hmm. this week. Um, pretty good debut. Yeah, very nice day indeed, if you want to put it there. You know, it's, it's tiny. Let's have a look at it. Came on at $2.55 in the IPO. Finished the opening day's trade at $2.65. Went up at as much as $2.73. So that's a, that's a very tiny thing. Look, the, the outdoor media space and the advertising digital space has been an interesting one. APN in their prospectus believe EBITDA will be about $53 million for a net profit for this full year at around about 27 28 So that's pretty okay. It's not brilliant, but it's certainly okay. Certainly does show a fairly reasonable turnaround from when it was actually inside APN. It does also bring about O Media. There is a lot of speculation this week around O Media. Channel 9 looks like they may have backed off, and I think O Media themselves are now very much looking at going the IPO road as well. They look like being a little bit more value, around about 100, sorry, 429 million compared to 425, but it will probably bid just as well as we saw with APN. So it was a good little IPO indeed. All right, Evan Lucas, IG, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it as always. Thanks, Nadine. We are taking a short break. Coming up on Media Week, more on the share market reaction to that news, plus all the radio and TV ratings of the week. Back in just a moment.